my shepherd. So verse 4, again I'll repeat it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Indeed, this morning we're only going to look at half of that verse. And we have, haven't we, I hope that you're engaged. We have these weeks looked closely at the shepherd's work in our life. We have seen that it is he, our shepherd, Christ himself, the great shepherd, came not to be served, but to serve. And give his life as a ransom. Our shepherd, Christ himself, purchased the salvation of his sheep and preserves them. That is almost, that, that is the very subject which we are here each week. We, it's almost like we're packing that in the envelope. That is our subject throughout each week. That he is the means, he is the very one himself who has saved the people unto himself, and he is the very one who preserves his people for himself. We have covered the great reality that God leads us into great comforts, reminding us of the sweet truth of the gospel. The green pastures, it can be said, and the still waters are both the great truths of the gospel applied to us, and also the gracious working of the paraclete himself, bringing these comforts and joys of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, friends, as we've gone through these weeks, God not only saves us from our sin, but through the work of his Holy Spirit, he is changing us from one degree of glory to another. He leads us in the paths of righteousness. We, dear friends, are led by God into the transforming power being made holy. And that is a question in and of and for ourselves. Are we changing? Are we seeing change in our lives? That's what we looked at last time. I again do quote John B. He says this in regards to sanctification. God's paths of righteousness include more than calling, regeneration, justification. The life of sanctification inevitably follows. I hope you hear that. He doesn't just save you and then he puts you over there and and that's it, and you're left to it. If you are saved, you are experiencing sanctification. That means you are, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by, I would dare say, the obedience of your giving to change, Colossians 3, you are changing. You are given to change. So we're not just saved and left to it. The reality is this, friends, as we go on through this song, a changed person, or let me put it better, a justified person looks like something. A justified person looks like something. A saved man or woman looks like something. There is fruit on the trees. John Bunyan said, Sanctification includes conflict and peace, surrender and victory, death and life. Justification leads to sanctification. Maybe some of these terminologies might be new to some of us. We are in a generation where you get saved and then you go on and live as you live. Be and do what you do. The word of God doesn't permit that nor allow it. A man who is saved, a man who is born of the Spirit, lives by the Spirit. Romans 8. And this is the wonder. Finishing that great quote of Joel Beek. Sanctification leads to perseverance in the faith. 
We then asked, didn't we, what do we mean by the word sanctification? And I said, a good and a proper question. Ephesians 4, 21 through to 24 reads, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the, your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Westminster Confession helps us. Sanctification is a work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. We are enabled, friends. This is not some effort of our own. This is not some dry, dirty path. This is a fruitful path. This is one aided by the Spirit where that sin that you once loved and enjoyed is becoming deader, if I can use that word. You're changing. Your desires are new. I say it again before we move on. A justified man looks like something. You are changing. Today, as you are back in your Christian life, you will see the work of the Spirit saying, I am not what I was, but I am what I am by the grace of God. You see, friends, sanctification is the process that prepares us for heaven. Daily being transformed into the image of Christ. What a great salvation we have. A shepherd who saves us preserves us and changes us. Thanks be to God that he did not leave us to ourselves. Then we come to this great promise, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Death, quite the subject, the subject which many don't want to talk about, the subject which is a taboo. And it's as I was preparing in the week, it reminds me very much of a subject I spoke some months ago about. And it's prompted by that great question in the Heidelberg Catechism, the first question indeed, which says this, what is our only comfort in life and in death? The answer is this, that I with both body and soul, both in life and death, not my own, but belong to my Saviour Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from the power of the devil and so preserved me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. What lovely words they are says. What truths indeed it is. Someone might say yes, but that's not scripture. I answer no, that the words that I've just read are very much not scripture. Nor are they trying to be. But rather a sweet, deep, methodical summary of biblical truth. These confessions, creeds, these catechisms have for centuries been both a defense and a proclamation of the truth. Amen. Friends, I want to say to you here, a life that watch your church, you and I, we should be most thankful that we have these sweet gems to refer to to help us. You see, some in the church in our generation seem to sadly want to erase and do away with church history. Tragic! 
Tragic. Completely and utterly tragic. Friends, I ask you to consider such things. Is this not a way in which the Lord has preserved his word? He's preserved his word. And he's done it through his people. Everywhere his word is today. I don't know how many Bibles you have, but I must have. I don't know. It's on your phone. It's everywhere. You know what? His word is preserved. And he has done it through the hands of men. Again, what a gracious, gracious God we have. I only suggest that rather than dismiss these catechisms, these, these statements of faith, that you would appreciate them and that you would use them as a help in growing in your understanding. So as we consider these great words of this great psalm, we should both be amazed and strengthened. Amazed and strengthened, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We, you and I, God's sheep, are being told that we should not fear evil in the very shadow or the valley of the shadow of death. We shouldn't fear it. There's no need to fear it. Not only is there hope in this world, indeed there is, but far, far more than that, we have an eternal hope. And the reality and the pangs of death should be to the Christian one that should not be feared. Shouldn't be feared. Death. Let me read to you a few scriptures. Psalm 46 verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. New Testament, the book of Matthew, the long reading, Matthew 6, 25 through to the end of the chapter. Therefore I say to you, said Jesus, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed by one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little of faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that, you're, knows that you need all these things. Verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And verse 34 says this, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Passage to which I'm sure you and I are so familiar with. These are just a very much of a glimpse at the very promises of God Himself to us, to you, His sheep. We have promises. The Bible tells us we have things. Yet, with all these promises and many more that we could list, we have them. Yet, I don't know if you would join me when I say this, but I think that I am convinced both of personal testimony and in watching over God's people that both in life and death that there are Christians today who are still riddled with fear. 
of the battles and the trials of this life. And sadly, even more so, the reality of facing death. You will die. You will die. I will die. I don't seek to revisit on ground, but I say for the sake of contest. Has not the past two to three years shown much reality of this? Fear. 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 <coughs> Everywhere we look, fear. 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 The whole world, yeah, not exaggerating, the whole world running about in a fear of a virus. Living in such fear that we were willing to give up the most important things in order to stay safe. Throw a stone if you must, but I believe I am right. Fear. In every corner of our land. You know what, friends? Of course, the world will behave like that. Why? Because they have no hope. They are without hope. And in, in reality, saints, I would dare say this. In fact, I do say this. They ought to be in fear. They ought to be fearful. To die without Christ is the greatest of calamities. To die without Christ is the greatest calamity. Why we see in Luke 13, he said, unless you repent. Remember, the tower of Sinai had fell, sacrifices, the blood had been spilled on the altars, and he didn't really directly answer it, did he? He said, unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. You see, there's something greater, but the world, the world ought to be in fear, for without Christ, there is hopelessness. And friends, though it sound most harsh, hell awaits such people. That's the world who ran around in fear. Yet, friends, sadly, the church behaved in no different way. Expressing in our conduct the same fear and an over knee eagerness to give up that which God had commanded. Again, as I've said, I seek not to revisit that in particular, but it is an example and it's something we ought to procrastinate upon. My point is this it's clear that Christians still fear. Death. I raise another reality that shows us, or another reality that shows this to be clear. And within, again, the so called church, there has been, maybe there still is, I'm sure that there is an obsession with a health and wealth and prosperity. Almost a demand that, that God would, would hear that every snap of our fingers. Though our own friends don't seek to do away with the reality that God does and can do such things, yet there has been an emphasis, yeah. an overemphasis, that this life is more important than that which is to come. The preserving of this life has been the pinnacle of Christianity. I want to say to you today, I believe that to be biblically wrong. And leaves men and women hopeless. And Christ in it all is mocked. It has, doesn't it, even in the church, and that's the focus here, things of the church. But the very world itself has been a very focus. Yeah. That which is temporal is and has been our focus. And I dare say. And say it carefully, it is, often, it is often that type of Christianity 
that it's proved itself most fearful in death. Andrew Walmack closed his healing meetings through COVID. I say no more. Again, friends, I don't seek to do away with the reality of a God who does good things, nor do I want to seem jovial in such things. But there is a sad reality that we have become, we, not the world now, we as Christians have become so fixated on the temple that it is quite disturbing. I don't want to do, I don't, again, I don't seek to do away with the reality that death brings sadness. Of course it does. Nor do I seek to present to you that we as Christians ought to be willing our deathbed to arrive. Not at all. But rather that we as Christians should be living with a greater reality than we currently are that death has no sting. That's the message. I wonder if we can really apply to our hearts that which the Apostle Paul te teaches us in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh Hades, where is your victory? Or can we join the same apostle when he saints to the church of Philippi? For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But I live on in the flesh. This will mean fruit for my labour, says Paul. What shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. You hear that? Which one is better? To live, to serve the church of Jesus Christ, or to be with the Christ of the church. Which is better? It's hard pressed, said Paul, between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Friends, our culture, and again, I'm talking about the church here, says so much different. I'm challenged by this. Let me tell you. You may be sat there thinking, well, you're not the Apostle Paul, Ryan. You'd be absolutely right. And you'd say, and I'm not the Apostle Paul. You'd be definitely right. You're not. Yet, my brethren, we have been saved by the same Lord. And we, like him, have been promised eternal life. Eternal life. Do you believe this morning that you have passed from darkness into light? Do you believe today that you will live on? Do you believe today that in your very life, of course, if you are Christ, that you will pass from this life into an next, into complete and utter bliss? I think we believe it. I think theologically we have it, but we live in many ways contrary to that profession. We've been promised eternal life. We have that same inheritance that is promised to all of God's elect. Listen to this. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, the Apostle Paul again saying this, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What day? Topic, isn't it? What day? On the last day. And God will split the heavens and shall gather together his people and he shall sift the wheat from the chaff and he shall pluck away the, the sheep and the goats on that day, on that last day when all is done and the arcing door is closed for Nito, done. It's over. Done, friends, it's done. On that day, says Paul, not only to me, God for them words, not to me only, 
But to who? But to who? All those who attended church is faithful. It doesn't say that. All those who sung well, all those who preached, no, 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 not at all. Unto me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We have a crown for us. Do you know it this morning? We have a crown away with us. You've got a crown. Forgive me. A crown awaiting you. Do we live life? So why is it with all these promises? I'm asking myself, believe me, if you know me, you know that I'm asking myself with all these great promises and a whole lot more, we, you and I as Christians, both fear troubles in this life and certainly fear death. It's a question we ought to be willing to have and willing to answer. I'm sure there could be many answers. Let me give you a few. Worst case scenario, if you are still riddled with such things, if fear is dominant in your life, worst case scenario is this, that you're not yet saved. Maybe for so long, the reason we have this fear is that we have suffered bad theology. I quote, Nathan here, when he said this, it was in the conversation, he's used it in public as well. Not only is bad theology cruel, wrong, but it is cruel. Maybe, and it's this point I trust you will hear, maybe it is a neglect or a lacking of faith in his promises to us. We don't believe what he says. To put it straightforward, A.W. Pink puts it like this. Hear me, please. If the Lord's people would more frequently make a prayerful and believing study of what the Word says upon the departure out of this world, death would lose much, if not all, all its terrors follow. But also, instead of doing so, they let their imaginations run riot and they give way to carnal fears. They walk by sight instead of faith. Friends, I confess that it may be a sad reality for some of you that fear is rampant because you have not yet believed. Maybe today still fear because bad teaching has been your meat and drink. You've been taught A and B. And that's why you'll only hear from me is that this is the very reason I want to first of all bring this to the life of this church. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. These are sweet truths to you, friends. This is a God who saves and preserves and changes his people, not only in this life, but prepares them for the life to which he has for you. Yet we are guilty, are we not? We have allowed our imaginations to run right. And have become, as I've already said, fixated with carnal matters and falling into fears that we should not. Take a ride off the ball, friends. We will be in fear a little like that for a day, two, three, four, and you become empty and void. All to be meditative far more than we are. We're fixated on this life. 
Christianity today, contemporary Christianity, is, is I am convinced of it, fixated in this life. That's why you and I still fear death. Because we think this is the pinnacle. Truly, we do think that this is the best life now. And friends, it's not. Because if it is, that makes heaven lower. That makes to be with Christ less than Matthew 10, 28 says this, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, I seek to apply this to you who are Christ's. You who belong to Christ, you who have believed, there's every reason to come now with your fear and put it at the cross. How, you ask? How do I do that? As Mr. Pink said, be frequent in the riches of God's word. They mean something to you. Allow the blessedness of prayer to be habitual in your life. Meditate on all you have and are in Christ Jesus. Meditate upon those things. Let it be your meat and drink. Go talk to Jesus about it all. You see, it's time, isn't it, friends, to come away from fear and live by faith. But if we are people who neglect the very means of grace in which ought to be our meat and drink, we wonder why we fear when we neglect prayer. We wonder why we fear when we need to fellowship. We wonder why we're full of fear when the Word of God lies dusty. We wonder why we are so fixated on that which is temporal when that which is eternal is second. Meditate upon the sweet things that Christ has given you. You heard it really from Nathan. He has given us eternal life. It's not something we're going to get. We're going to see the fullness of it. But we have it now. You are his, and he is yours. See, God's word tells us of a glorious day when we shall see him who was pierced. Do you believe that? Yeah. You shall see him face to face. It's not a myth or a story or a hope or a name. You shall see him. In fact, all shall see him. Every knee shall bow to the glory of God the Father. That's your future. Your future is with him. Is with him. May we seek to live like that rather than display fear as though God has not saved us. For living in fear, we live as if God is a liar. I say it again. If we live in fear, friends, let me let me let me make something clear. I'm not talking about a bad day here. I'm talking about habitual fear. You're dominated by it. Stop living like that. You have nothing to fear. Christ is the champion. He is the victor. And if we live contrary to that, we make him out to be a liar. Allow these great words of Psalm 116 to cover you this morning. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. No doubt we will through these weeks refer to scriptures and like this again. But how sweet that should be to those who are in Christ. Friends, when the time comes, when you meet with death from this life into the next, let me say this, you who belong to Christ, you will be the object of special grace. He will gather his angels and take you unto himself. What peace that should be to God's own flock this morning. Spurgeon says this, We go through the dark tunnel of death and emerge into the light of immortality. He goes on, listen, we do not die and go to sleep and wake up in glory. 
Death is not the house but the porch. Not the goal but the passage to it. Friends, remember the issue of evil is not that we are promised that that will happen. It doesn't say that. But rather that we shall not fear it. We have no fear in death. The Christian is given grace for the valley. I don't know how you or I might be death, but we shall meet it. But we ought to be very encouraged this morning that we are God's and we ought not fear it. But more than that, friends, something wonderful, I know I've said this before, but something that is, is amazed, which I've already touched, we will be ushered into heaven by God's angels. <clears throat> Listen to this, Luke 16. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died. Listen. And he was carried by the angels to Abraham, Abraham's bosom. What's he say of the rich man? You want your Bible open and tell you the rich man also died of his bed. You see the hope and the hopelessness? You see this rich man live sumptuously. I did that on Thursday. I, I went out for two meals, I did about 13 slices of cake. <laughs> says he did it every day. Lazarus, swords, dogs with Paul, Nini. What matters is this. When he died, have you seen someone die? Breath going. Imagine what's happening. It, it amazes me. It, in fact, it, it intrigues me. It massively interests me. That at that moment, I saw my own dad die. It was a sweet, sweet day. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But it was. It was. It was glorious. And it was this song that was quoted. And that experience of his breath faded and faded. And in the supernatural, the things that we cannot yet see or even comprehend in the supernatural, God was sending a chariot of angels and bringing his soul into the very presence of Christ Jesus. What a saviour. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Friends, we need to believe it. Compare the rich man and Lazarus. Let me finish. What a blessed hope. Not only in this life. Friends, Paul said, if we were only in this life, we ought to be pitied. When you and I meet with death, we can be assured that we need not feel evil. Fear evil. We have our shepherd's great comfort. We have the chariot of his angels taking us to Christ, very bosom. Again I say, what blessed hope. This friend is our comfort both in life and death. I read it again, that I, with both body and soul, both in life and death, I'm not my own. You grasp that, you're not your own in death. You will not be left, not forsaken in death. In fact, you will have, I believe, even more of a special presence than you've ever experienced. But I belong to my Saviour Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins. Friend, don't fear. Sins have been dealt with. Death has no sting. Why? Because sin has been dealt with. Satan has been crushed. He has no power. He's fully satisfied for all my sins. And delivered me from all the power of the devil. <coughs> and so preserves me. That 
that without the will of my Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. You believe it. I'm not asking if you've got a theological position on it. I'm asking you, do you believe it? Do you this morning apply that to your very, very daily life? When that diagnosis comes, when that loved one has gone, do you apply it? Friends, God is sovereign in all things. He has decreed all things to the pleasure of his own will. When in your darkest moment, in that very moment, the most painful, grievous thing happens, are you saying with all certainty? And so he preserves me. That without my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. I, no doubt, like you, have questioned things of God in my life. Why has he permitted them? Permitted them, he did. Why? Because he is good. He is good. And in the darkest day in which you will have suffered, know this, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore by his Holy Spirit, he assures me all that you would get that. He assures me of eternal life. Makes me sincerely, friend, as it made you sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live for it. Christian, rejoice this morning. Maybe this morning there are those, even in this room, who still not bow the knee to Christ. In fact, your knees are like steel. In fact, you rebel and you won't. You must. Let me say it, friends, you will. Either in this life under mercy or on that day. <coughs> on that day. Under judgment. I say this again. I do not do not fear those who kill the body. I rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul and hell. That's the word of God. You may be still the one who is concerned or concern is that of this world. You live as though Christ did not die for your sins. You live without any fear of God at all. It is Christ who said you should be the one who fears. Fear God in whom you continue to reject is the one who will one day destroy both body and soul. I plead with you, come now and flee from the fleeting pleasures. And they are the fleeting. Come from the fleeting pleasures of this world and today, even now, come to Christ. Exchange your fear for faith. Believe now in Him who freely gives eternal life. I ask you, even though you might not come and seek me out and give you the answer, but I ask you, with all sincerity, with all sincerity, what is your comfort in life and death? Is it your atheistic stance? Is it? God doesn't exist anywhere. Do you know what? God will have the last laugh. Turn to God who gives eternal life. Believer. Believer. Saint. Chosen. The elect of God. Israel of God. Today be strengthened by this promise of the psalm that you all fear no evil, for he is with you. Amen. Amen.